Good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, depending where you are joining us from, and welcome to today's presentation. My name is Zach Tallis from the Business Review, and I will be your moderator for uh, this presentation today. It's my pleasure to have with us today ARX, who will be discussing Clearing the Fog, Digital Signatures in Life Sciences. Uh, our guest speaker for today is Rod Schlerf. Rod is the FDA Markets Manager at ARX. Um, I'd just like to remind uh, the audience that you can submit questions using the questions tool at the top right hand corner of your screen and you can do this throughout the whole presentation as and when you think of any questions or if you have any thoughts that you'd like to get across to Rod and we'll allocate around 10 to 15 minutes to um, address any questions or thoughts. So, um, Without further ado, um, I would just like to hand over to uh, Rod. So, Rod, if you'd just like to click on your screen, you should now have control. Okay, thanks, Zach, and uh, thanks to the attendees uh, to today's webinar. As Zach mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about digital signatures and some of the confusion and FUD that's in the marketplace um, over the next hour. A um, little disclosure here. Um, as Zach mentioned, I do work for a digital signature vendor. ARX. However, the intention is not to talk about my company's product. Instead, I'm talking about the use of digital signatures um, throughout the industry. Uh, but first, a little background on ARX and the credibility that we have to talk about digital signatures. So we are the world's largest supplier of standard digital signatures, and I will define digital signatures and the standard shortly. Um, in fact, our market share is such that uh, we have more organization using our Cosign product than all alternative solutions combined. Um, as an organization, we focus on bringing solutions to both government as well as highly regulated uh, security-minded industries, including life sciences, which is the top market that we serve. Um, as you would have guessed, as a leader in the marketplace, uh, we have a lot of very large pharmaceutical, medical device, clinical research organizations, as well as government entities, including U.S. Health and Human Services, using our product. In fact, it's estimated that we have approximately 90% of all digital signature deployments in the life sciences industry. Okay, enough about ARX. What are we going to discuss today? Uh, first, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what a digital signature is and uh, why it's important to this audience today. And we'll talk about its relevance in certain applications within the life sciences industry. The heart of the discussion today, however, is talking about some of the components, some of the attributes of a potential digital signature vendor and technology that you might be considering uh, for your own operations. Um, as Zach mentioned, there's an opportunity for questions and answers and submit your questions on the, on the questions tab on the right hand, hand side. Well, thanks, and let's go ahead and get started. So, uh, you know, clearing the fog, there is a lot of fog, there is a lot of misunderstanding in the marketplace about what digital signatures are and uh, where digital signatures are being used. Uh, and the term digital signatures is very well defined, but there's a lot of confusion um, and people claiming things are digital signatures when really they're just electronic signatures. And we'll talk about that today. So before we get started, I just want to kind of poll the audience to understand um, current usage of uh, signature technology. Perfect. Thank you very much for that, Rod. So yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as Rod said, uh, we'd uh, like to kickstart things uh, with a poll question. So your screen should turn blue with the following question. Uh, what signature tools are you currently using today in your business? Uh, now there are five options there. Paper and pen, electronic signatures, digital signatures, uh, you don't know, or multiple solutions. So we'll give you around uh, 45 seconds to cast your vote. And in, in the meantime, time Rod, um, I'd just like to ask for a comment um, as to why uh, you asked this particular question. Well, Zach, one thing I'm trying to do is just benchmark the audience and see their understanding in technology usage today. I'm also interested in, as we do these webinars every six to 12 months, to see the, the changes in the percentages as people start using electronic and digital signatures more often. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much for that. 
So um, I'm just going to go ahead and close the, uh, the, the poll there, and I'm going to go ahead and share those results. So uh, just over 80% of our audience today actually uh, put a vote in. And um, again, uh, Rod, uh, are, are those um, results um, surprising or any different um, from last time? I, I guess uh, not too much there, Zach. It's not a surprise that uh, an audience attending this webinar today wants to learn more about digital signatures, likely because they're... Uh, they're not using them today, or they're not sure if they're using them today. Um, so this um, this is actually good, and we have a lot of informative information for the um, the people just learning about digital signatures. Excellent, excellent, great. So I'm just going to go ahead and hide the results from the audience and yourself. And if you'd just like to continue on, um, and um, yeah. Okay, terrific. Thanks. So um, first of all, let's let's define digital signatures. Um, a typical process of how digital signatures are applied and what this means, what's the benefit of using digital signatures. Uh, for those of the audience that are not aware, a digital signature is a term that we use to describe a standard form of electronic signature. Um, in the layman's terms, we, we call this a digital signature. Um, these are well-defined standards. They've been around for quite some time. Um, in the US, where I reside, uh, the National Institutes for Standards and Technology is the main standards bodies that publishes and maintains the digital signature standard, but other countries, other jurisdictions, other industry bodies also adopt the same digital signature standard. Um, we're not going to see a demo of a uh, document being digitally signed today, so I just kind of want to walk through a, a typical process of a document being signed and then what happens after it's signed. So someone wants to sign a document. It's uh, an office document. It's a PDF. It's an HTML form, whatever. It's available from their PC, or maybe it's a document they have access to through a web browser. Um, in the market that uh, we compete in, in the life sciences industry, there's considerations about 21 CFR Part 11, but also just industry best practices. And this dictates that every time someone wants to sign a document, they're forced to authenticate typically with a username and password, as well as enter a reason code. Now, once these two items are um, entered, within a fraction of a second, the document is signed. And what that means is that the contents of that document are calculated as a mathematical equivalency. We call that a document hash, which is then sent to a secure signing environment, typically a, a black box server available on the network, and this server contains a couple of critical items. One is a unique digital signature key used to sign this document contents. The second item is a digital certificate, which is a digital identity card for the signer, which is embedded with the signature in the document. And then the signer is also given the option to include any graphical images, such as a handwritten signature, when they manifest their signature within that document. So uh, these three items are uh, embedded back into the document, and the result is a uh, digitally signed electronic record. Now one other comment here is that uh, most digital signature technologies today for enterprise use by employees, the technology is integrated with the user directory structure of that organization. This is the network access controls that we all do when we log in the morning to our PC. We're actually logging into our network through LDAP or Active Directory. And with this integration, we're talking about uh, medium or, in most cases, high assurance digital identities because the user directory structure is tied back to the business processes you have in onboarding a new employee um, and controlling them and network access throughout the organization. As opposed to digital signature systems that don't have this integration, we're talking about very low or no uh, confidence in the digital identities. Um, so we've just signed a document. And what does it look like when someone receives this signed document and wants to take a look at the information? Well, for every signature that's embedded in any of these file formats, there's vis visible information. This typically includes information like the name, email address, job title, reason code. It also includes the time date stamp when the signature was applied. If this user is chosen to um, display their graphical signature, you'll also see their 
um, their signature embedded. And then the applications that are being signed that support digital signatures will tell you whether you should trust, not trust, or have questionable trust over any particular signature contained within that electronic record. Now, digital signatures are active components embedded within these files. So if I click on any one of the signatures, I start to reveal additional metadata. And this is the three eyes of digital signatures. The first eye being more information about the identity of the signer. In this case, I've also included the email address of the signer. I can drill down and take a look at this digital certificate, this ID card, see who issued it, why I'm trusting this identity, how long the identity is valid for, and other information. Again, more information about the intent, including the reason code, and the time date stamp when the signature was applied. And then the integrity. So information about any changes uh, that might have taken place to the document after any particular signature was applied. So as you can see, we're not just replacing uh, pen on paper. We're actually adding additional security into any signature dependent business process. Um, what this means is that anyone receiving the digitally signed electronic record can immediately trust and verify the signatures contained within. So it's not just the signer himself or any employee within the organization that the signer came from, but any outside party that you're securely exchanging documentation with or doing electronic submissions to can immediately uh, verify these signed documents. And this is all done independent of the vendor or the technology used. It's done independent of the signer and the signer's organization that created the signature. So you're really creating sustainable electronic records that can be verified over time. Um, how is this trust established? Um, this is a core concept of digital signatures. Basically, any party that's receiving digitally signed electronic records simply needs to do a one-time trust ceremony of the organization from which that signer came from. And this is uh, the best practice and the common practice. There's a couple of different trust models being used in the industry. By and large, the largest trust model, most common trust model, is what's known as controlled trust. And this is this one-time trust ceremony. So if I expect to be uh, um, a CRO, I expect to be receiving lots of signed documents from a sponsor. I go ahead and download and distribute the public identity of that sponsor to all of my employees. And then from that point forward, <clears throat> any document I receive from that sponsor will be automatically trusted and verified. There are other models. Um, a few years ago, people talked about web trust. And uh, these are, are different trust models put forward largely by Microsoft and Adobe. Um, they're less common. They're not universal. The Microsoft trust model generally isn't supported by Adobe and vice versa, um, and they haven't uh, taken off much either. Um, another thing would be a membership-based um, trust network. Um, and this concept came up uh, about a decade ago from an organization called Safe Biopharma, where they put forward the concept that if you became a member of, of their nonprofit organization, then you could automatically trust and verify signed documents from any other member. Um, this is very much a conceptual solution. It's not widely used. In fact, the usage has been diminished over the past few years. Um, it's also a common practice in some countries in Europe, um, to some degree within government applications. Um, before we talk about the, uh, the common components of digital signatures, I want to talk about where digital signatures are being, being used today in life science organizations. Um, certainly within an enterprise, so for enterprise use throughout an organization, if you want a consisting signing environment within a group, within a division, department, business unit, throughout an entire enterprise, um, this is very much uh, in the sweet spot of digital signatures. On the other hand of the spectrum is cloud applications. So these could be cr collaborative cloud applications where individuals from multiple organizations all participate in a cloud application and need to sign documents, and other people need to trust those signed documents. So this could be a SaaS vendor, or this could be a private cloud propped up by uh, a life sciences company 
for their business partners to sign documents. The third area that's important is to understand that the software vendors are aware and support digital signatures. And vendors such as ARX, we have a whole group dedicated to making sure that Microsoft, Adobe's, Oracle's, and others continue to provide proper support for digital signatures. So within the enterprise I talked about, um, digital signatures are being used extensively throughout these enterprises, both in regulated and non-regulated operations. Um, and although the FDA does require the use of digital signatures in open systems, many of these companies use digital signatures for closed, system, uh, closed systems and for good reason. And the applications that you might see digital signatures, including things like the core quality management system within an enterprise, so signing of all the SOPs, work instructions, training records, any documents used to support an FDA audit. Uh, up through mundane stuff like signing of HR forms, financial reports, um, and spreadsheets within the finance department. Um, for SaaS and cloud applications, this is a very growing area. So many of the large SaaS vendors as, were, as well as private enterprises propping up a, a cloud application use digital signatures today. One of the more common applications is, is within e-clinical portals. So this could be a sponsor, a CRO, or a SaaS vendor propping up a web application with digital signatures embedded so that all the different investigators and coordinators, IRBs, et cetera, anyone working on a study that needs to sign off on documents can sign within the cloud. And then the software vendors specifically. So many of these vendors today and a growing number every day support digital signatures. So really any e-forms vendor, workflow vendor, document management, content management vendor today uh, is aware of digital signatures and either already has support or is looking at supporting digital signatures. So the e-forms vendors, the Microsofts, Adobe's, and others of the world currently support digital signatures. <coughs> custom web apps. So if you develop your own custom web app, um, there's APIs and software development kits available for you to be able to easily integrate digital signatures um, with your application. Uh, workflow vendors and document management vendors. Um, and uh, this is a small list of vendors that currently have a standard connection to digital signature technologies um, for you to use. Uh, now we're ready for our second question. Um, and Zach? Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are now heading into the second poll for today's session. So, just like the first time, your screen should now turn blue with the following question and answers. Do Microsoft and Adobe provide digital signatures? Yes, no, or you don't know? So, we will give you uh, another like 45 seconds to cast your, your vote. And in the meantime, uh, Rod, I, I'd just like to ask you a comment about uh, as to why you asked this question. Sure, so uh, this is part of the fog, and I could have added many other vendors um, besides just Microsoft and Adobe. Uh, but many people confuse um, supporting digital signatures with providing digital signatures, or using the term digital signature when they mean electronic signature. And this is part of the confusion in the marketplace, and I'm curious um, how the audience is going to respond to this question. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much for that. So, uh, yeah, we'll give you guys another couple of seconds to cast your votes. And I'd just like to remind the audience to, uh, to continue to submit questions. And you can do this via the, the questions tool at the top right-hand corner of your screen. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and close the poll. And uh, like last time, I will share those results for you. So, uh, uh, Rod, on your screen, you should be able to see those results. Um, are, are they surprising at all? It is surprising, uh, and I think a lot of people probably answered yes um, because they understand that Microsoft and Adobe and some of these other vendors do support digital signatures so they can easily connect to digital signature technology. And or there may be members of the audience who believe that uh, Adobe's acquisition of uh, electronic signature vendor um, EchoSign means that they provide digital signatures, which they don't. Um, and we'll talk about this a little further when we're talking about some of the considerations in selecting digital signature vendors.
Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much for that there, Rod. So I'm just going to go ahead and hide those results from you. And uh, yeah, if you'd like to just continue on and um, uh, we'll, we'll um, speak soon. Okay. So the heart of the discussion today is, is common components and our perspective on uh, what you should be thinking about when you select a, a proper digital signature solution for your operations. And there's five main components that I'm going to talk about. Um, I call them the five C's of proper digital signatures. They deal with compliance and compliance issues, which I think we all understand. The next two, choice and control, uh, from our perspective, is you should have the freedom to choose complementary technologies and control the way you're using digital signatures and not have the vendor dictate. Obviously, uh, cost is a consideration. So there's an excellent ROI for digital signatures, but you may be uh, reducing that ROI if you're um, you're embracing an expensive solution. And then finally, centralized. Uh, and this really goes back to digital signatures being used 10 years ago that were not centralized and dramatically impacted the cost of uh, deployments. So let's first start with compliance. There's multiple areas here that make up compliance considerations. Uh, the first is uh, if you're looking for a digital signature, you should make sure that that vendor is truly delivering a digital signature and adheres to the standards. And it's very easy to, uh, to ask the vendor if they comply with the NIST digital signature standards, uh, as well as other bodies that, that publish these, these standards. Um, and there's other independent standards bodies out there, including ISO. Uh, if you look at the ISO uh, 32000 PDFA standard, they include the digital signature standard, as does OASIS in their uh, web services definition for integrating technologies with digital signatures. So there's a wide variety of standards bodies, all defining the same standard that you, you should ask the vendor, listen, are you a digital signature vendor or are you an electronic signature vendor? The second one, and probably most important to most compliance people in this audience, is compliance with FDA standards. Um, and we're not talking about Part 11 as a whole. We're going to drill down specifically and talk about uh, paragraph 11.30, which is controls for open systems. And in the uh, language used by the FDA, they talk about the uh, uh, pro use of uh, appropriate digital signature standards for any open system. So what's an open system? Um, I would define an open system is any system where documents are being signed within one organization, and those documents are then securely exchanged or submitted to some outside organization. Or any, uh, any system where documents are being signed um, by outside parties and being brought back inside and need to be trusted and verified. So it's these, these documents that flow beyond any one organization. Okay. People also talk about digital signatures when they talk about electronic submissions. Here in the U.S. with the FDA's electronic submissions gateway in particular. Um, and the FDA on their website even talks a little bit about digital signatures. But from my perspective, they're improperly using the term digital signatures and they should be using the term digital certificates, being used for authentication. So when the FDA talks about uh, digital signatures submitting a document across the gateway, they're really talking about authenticating the submitter um, that's submitting whatever across the gateway. Um, in fact, they even suggest you can create your own unique identity, give it to them, and they'll go ahead and trust it. So uh, this, is, this is really not uh, the proper use of digital signatures. Um, with, with digital signatures, many people refer to them as the third wave of compliance with Part 11, which I think is a, is a good way to look at it. And when you go back to the initial release of uh, the guidance back in April of 97, is uh, companies were just remediating existing computer systems with what they perceived to be the requirements of the FDA. And around the same time, Documentum and Open Text with LiveLink and other vendors eventually joining the market said no. Um, here's a way to comply with Part 11 by deploying this, this quality management system, this document management system, with a huge repository of all your controlled documents. And we'll allow you to either scan the signed documents and put them in this repository, or eventually some of those vendors also said, hey, we'll provide you with a proprietary electronic signature so you can sign documents inside of the repository. Um, and then around year 2000, Really, J&J &J and Pfizer 
began advocating the use of digital signatures, which means that you can sever any dependency on the repository in order to trust and verify signed documents. And this gives organizations great flexibility and agility so that if I use Documentum for 10 years um, and was using digital signatures and I want to migrate to SharePoint or whatever the new hot thing is tomorrow, then I can easily migrate my controlled documents because the signatures are embedded in the documents and not part of the proprietary database of the system that I was previously using. Um, for global companies, we also need to consider uh, local jurisdictions and country-specific requirements. And in Europe, the Europeans, when they defined their directive on electronic signatures, were very specific down to technology details. Unlike here in the U.S. with eSign, it's very subjective and very generalized. Well, in Europe, uh, in government applications in particular, um, you have to use digital signatures as defined by both quality and uh, qualified and advanced electronic signatures. Now, that does not necessarily mean that pharmaceutical companies have to abide by these specific requirements, as there are typically guidelines used for government-to-government -government applications or someone submitting documents directly to the government. But still, it's something to consider. So any organization doing business in Europe needs to understand the importance of digital signatures in this marketplace. And then obviously, you want to comply with what the software vendors support. And the software vendors today, they simply support this digital signature standard, and they don't provide standard support for proprietary electronic uh, signature technologies. So if a vendor is proprietary, they're going to have their own unique plug-in. Yet if they're leveraging digital signatures, then the uh, software applications will automatically be able to work with their technologies. So that's it for compliance. Uh, the second category uh, I want to talk about is choice, so freedom to choose. From our perspective, a digital signature system should not be an e-form solution a workflow solution, or a document management or content management solution. That does not mean that digital signatures should not be the signature engine embedded in this machine, which includes other parts, including forms and document management and workflow technologies. But the core digital signature technology should be just that, a machine that provides standard digital signatures. Um, and this integrated machine doesn't have to be complex, so it's not like you're buying an engine and then designing a car around it. The machine can be extremely simple, such as just having digital signature technology and the desktop authoring tools, Word, Excel, PDF, InfoPath, PowerPoint, etc. This is a full machine. This way many people are using digital signatures today. Um, but uh, many companies, as they start to broaden the use of digital signatures by their employees, by their business partners, start to integrate uh, digital signatures into a, a more complex or feature-rich uh, machine, which might include enterprise-wide applications like SharePoint, workflow technologies, specific eForms technologies. And of course, uh, when you're talking about today's uh, workers and working with business partners, working with collaborators, and maybe in healthcare settings, it's important to recognize that users aren't always sitting in front of a PC running a Microsoft OS. People are using all kinds of different computing technologies today, including Macs, smartphones, and tablets. Um, so the, uh, the third area that I want to highlight is control. And again, philosophically, at ARX, we believe that organizations need to govern their business in the way they see fit and not have to change what they're doing just because some outside vendor doesn't support the way they run their business. So again, it's your choice. You know how to govern your business. You know how, to, how you want to control your business. Force the digital signature uh, vendor and the vendor's technology to fit into the way you want to do things. So what does that mean? Um, a good example would be the way you identity proof your own employees and your business partners. You already have policies and procedures in place. When a new employee comes on board, they need to sign various forms, 
Some of these forms, like here in the U.S., the I-9 form needs to be signed in a face-to-face -face encounter with someone of that organization. And uh, at the completion of this uh, new hire onboarding process, the person is placed within the user directory structure of that organization, most commonly Microsoft Active Directory. So the IT security policies start to kick in and say, uh, fill out this form, we'll add you to our network directory structure and define what business applications, including digital signature services, that you have rights to use. And we also want you to use whatever technology we determine is appropriate for you to prove who you are anytime you want to access any of these applications, including authenticating to digitally sign a document. So again, your own, your own policies, procedures, complementary technologies, working with the digital signature technology you bring in-house. Now, cost effectiveness. Um, the good news is, is that the price of digital signature uh, solutions has come down dramatically in the past decade. And there's more vendors in the marketplace. There's competition also helping to drive down these costs. The bad news is, is that there's still a wide variance in the total cost of ownership. So if you're not doing your homework, um, there's lots of hidden costs beyond just buying a software license that you need to consider. And I just bulleted out uh, uh, here are a few of the, um, well, before I get to that, um, I'm going to reference a, uh, an article, and this is from about five or six years ago, that, um, that analyzed three different approaches to digital signature uh, technologies. And you'll see how widely the pricing varies. So the first was information on uh, server-based centralized digital signature solutions, which uh, would include technologies like we provide at ARX or Cosign product. Um, the second approach would be a third party managed PKI digital signature service, so a cloud service. And uh, the third alternative was kind of build your own, which was popular back about 10 to 15 years ago. And the analysis pulling information from vendors, uh, service providers, Microsoft, VeriSign, and others, is that the, um, the total cost of ownership uh, from one solution to the next is that a managed third-party service could be as much as four or five times as expensive as these uh, standard products. And building your own could be as much as 20 times more expensive than some of these new products in the marketplace. So again, do your homework um, and, and price compare. And uh, beyond just the, life, uh, the license cost, there's 10 other things I want to highlight for you to consider. One is, uh, Beyond just the cost of the system and the installation and setup, what does it cost to validate the system? What does it cost to qualify the vendor? These are questions you need to ask. What is the uh, solution that the vendor offers to be compliant with Part 11 for signing various file formats, including Microsoft Office? And if you're using older versions of Microsoft Office, like Office 2003, and there still is people doing that. How is that supporting digital signatures? Um, if you're signing PDFs and, and you're using Adobe, do all of your users have Adobe Acrobat, which supports digital signatures? Or does the vendor allow you to sign PDFs without having uh, widespread use of Adobe licenses? Um, what's the cost to integrate with various other business systems being used throughout the enterprise, SharePoint, or OpenText LiveLink, or Oracle Systems, or EMC Documentum. So what's the cost and effort to do this integration? Or are there, there standard uh, off-the-shelf integrations that you can leverage, obviously reducing your validation cost as well? Um, can the technology be used to sign from any computing platform, not just PCs, but also Macs? and other mobile computing devices. Are the licenses transferable? Um, this is starting to change a little bit, but geez, as recently as three to five years ago, some of these vendors would charge you uh, for redundant licenses for, for each of your signers. Or if a signer uh, used their technology um, for a few months and then left the company, could you reassign this license to another employee? 
is there any restriction on the usage associated with these licenses? So am I allowed to sign as much as I want? Or can I sign 10 times or 100 times or 500 times and then I'm cut off? I need to expand my license? Good question. Um, how, is, how are the digital identities generated? And how are they managed? How do I re remove someone's identity if they leave the company? How do I refresh information about the user if, if perhaps their email address changes or their maiden name changes? Um, how are the users managed? So am I distributing out technology and software and user-specific information out to the individual computers that people are signing from? That sounds like a system administrative nightmare. Where is there the ability to do centralized system administration with some of the newer technologies? Again, is the system centralized or is it distributed? And with a centralized solution, or even with a distributed solution, um, how is this impacted as I grow the number of users from 25 to 50 to 500 to 5,000 and more? Then finally, how long does it take for the system to be deployed and operational? Is it an hour or two? Do I need to have someone on site? Can it be done over the phone? Can it be self-installed? Are we talking about uh, a long project that takes days, weeks, or even months to deploy? Okay, um, now in summary, excuse me, we have one more category to consider, and that's the centralized architecture, which I talked about before. And this is just a common architectural drawing for digital signature technologies today. Typically, the, the technology is delivered either in a server that's installed, owned, and operated by the end user organization or accessible in a shared cloud environment. And on this server, there are the three main components for each user, including their signature key, their digital identity, and their graphical signatures. And then in order to use this technology, is oftentimes there's a software agent locally on the different machines allowing them to interact with the server. It's a very simple machine using the digital signature engine. For enterprise usage, most of the proper digital signature solutions today also integrate with the network uh, directory structures like Active Directory or LDAP. Um, but these systems can be expanded greatly where users can maybe handle all their signing needs through a browser without any local software on the machines. So again, you want, don't want to have to distribute software out to your PCs and Macs and other devices throughout your enterprise. Um, you should be able to use the technology through a VPN server. So if you're using uh, remote services, you should be able to easily allow anyone dialing in through this remote service to digitally sign uh, documents throughout the enterprise. And then for any of these other applications throughout the enterprise, SharePoint, other web applications, quality management systems, you should be able to apply digital signatures from within these applications. So now in summary, before we start the Q&A, um, digital signatures are not simply replacing pen and paper. Um, there's additional security added to digitally signed documents, including identity uh, certificates for each signer and the ability to prove that changes haven't taken place or if changes did take place to the document contents, show what those changes are. Um, it's very simple to establish a trust network with your business partners um, through these one-time trust ceremonies I talked about before. This is a core technology and common practice for digital signature deployments. Um, digital signatures are being used extensively throughout life science enterprises and cloud applications throughout both uh, a back office uh, GA type operations through the core uh, research and development, manufacturing, clinical, um, and regulated operations of any life sciences organization. Um, and again, when considering uh, and choosing a digital signature solution, you consider the, uh, the five C's. Compliance issues, not just FDA compliance, but ensuring that the vendor provides standard digital signatures, which are allowable not just in the US and Europe, but uh, other countries throughout the world. Choice, 
uh, focusing on buying the best signature engine you can and making sure that this engine can easily connect to other e-forms, workflow solutions, and document management systems of your choosing. Control, uh, not having to change the way you're running your business today or governing your operations and business processes, uh, but having the vendor's technology uh, easily plop in and, and um, support your policies and procedures. Again, cost effectiveness. The cost of these solutions varies greatly. Do your homework. Understand what the, uh, the listed price is of software licenses and other components, but also hidden costs that you may not have thought about before. And then centralized. Um, you know, this, this approach of uh, distributing out software and digital identities to individual users um, is really a, a, a dead concept. Today, uh, the technology needs to be centralized. Um, the presentation today is available, and I'm also, also available for specific questions if you'd like to ask me directly. Uh, the easiest way to get in touch with me and my team is at fda at arx.com. Excellent. Thank you very much for that there, Rod. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are now moving into uh, the, the Q&A session. So if you haven't already, please submit your questions. Uh, we have around uh, 15 minutes to try and answer as many as possible. If your question has not been answered um, uh, in its allocated time, then please take note of the contact details on your screen. And uh, by all means, I'm sure Rod will be uh, happy to answer uh, your thoughts. So I'll just jump straight in there, Rod. Um, the first, quest, first question, uh, what is the typical effort involved in validating digital signature systems? Okay, terrific. Good question in the subject we just talked about. So it does vary vendor by vendor. Um, the, the approach that I'm familiar with is actually the approach we use at ARX with our Cosign product. Um, today the ideal solution is, is to have digital signatures delivered um, through like a black box server or as we call it at ARX, an appliance. It's a dedicated system that cannot be hacked or tampered or have any, any uh, other software loaded on it. And it operates as, as any appliance does, like a computer or like a router. And so with this approach, uh, validation has actually greatly uh, reduced the effort. Um, and really spending most of your time qualifying the vendor who designed, manufactured, and delivered this uh, black box appliance approach as opposed to interrogating the software loaded on the, uh, the appliance itself. Um, as far as efforts are concerned, um, typically most of our clients do their own validation work. We as a vendor do provide uh, some complimentary uh, documentation to support the, uh, the quality plan. Um, and there's companies out there that have experience in validating both our Cosign product and other technologies as well. Excellent. Thank you very much there. Uh, someone has asked uh, uh, a question. I believe they must have submitted it through, uh, during the presentation. Uh, but they asked, um, uh, will you talk about how uh, the electronic signatures are stored? Right. Um, again, so we're talking about a subcategory, a subgroup of the total electronic signature market, which is digital signatures. And uh, in, the, in the old days, going back, you know, not, there's still people doing this today, is digital signatures, which include the signing key and the digital certificate, the identity card I talked about before. Uh, in the old days, they were loaded onto smart cards or a secure hardware token and then physically handed over to, to users to sign. So when someone signed, they actually swiped the smart card or, or plugged in their, their hardware token to their machine. Uh, you can only imagine the complexity of, of using this type of architecture uh, on a wide scale. And, and really, a lot of the uh, early deployments using this, this strategy failed or took a very long time to, uh, to be successfully deployed. Today, all of the different keys and certificates, all the stuff for someone to use is stored in this centralized server, this black box appliance. And as long as you have access through the internet or through the network, and communicate with the server. Um, you can apply your, your digital signature um, without having it ever exposed locally on your machine. Perfect. Thank you very much for that. 
Um, another question has has come in is um, what is the primary difference between e-signature and digital signature in the IT world? Right. So a digital signature is a term we use for standard uh, electronic signatures. The standard is known as PKI. As I mentioned before, the standard is published and maintained by uh, by NIST and other standards bodies outside the U.S. Um, there's multiple vendors, so any of these vendors adheres to these standards. And the wonderful thing is that uh, then any of these desktop authoring tools or business systems from Microsoft, Adobe, Oracle, OpenText, whoever, um, will plug and play with any of these vendors' digital signature systems. There were, outside of digital signatures, the rest of the electronic signature world um, is largely what's known as proprietary signature solutions, meaning a vendor came up with a scheme that they embed in their software that allows you to sign documents, typically as a detached element. So you have a, you have a database with a document and then some electronic signature information. And as long as you can access that application and have a license and that system still around, you can verify and, and be part 11 compliant. What you don't have is the ability to just open up a document independent of that system that was used and perform the verification. Perfect. Thank you very much for that. Uh, the next question is, this, is a slightly um, long one, so I'll just jump straight in. If a company already has PKI certificates, um, can FDA uh, I believe uh, this is an abbreviation, um, ECTD submission documents be digitally uh, and submitted, uh, be signed digitally, sorry, and submitted through Gateway without any issue, or do we need to uh, do anything extra to have a valid submission? Yeah, so, um, and I brought this up before, and I was talking about FDA compliance on the one slide, is uh, there's, this is part of the fog, the compliance and the FDA is guilty. So are some other regulatory authorities, by the way. I, I'm familiar with the Italian regulatory authorities who have the same confusion out there. Um, the FDA at the Electronic Submission Gateway is not talking about signatures on documents um, when they talk about digital signatures. They're talking about the, the signing or authenticating of the actual submission across the gateway. Um, in fact, they even say, even if you have digitally signed or electronically signed or paper um, supporting documents as part of the submission, um, best practice for them is to flatten them into a PDF file as an attachment to the submission. So digital signatures through the gateway is all about creating a digital identity for you to hand over to the FDA, they put into a list of trusted identities, and then when you do this submission, um, they, they can verify that it's actually you doing the submission and not someone else that they haven't uh, talked to before. So, uh, you know, ECTD, um, all the supporting documents um, can be digitally signed and, and part of the submission. But uh, the language being used on the Submission Gateway website um, is not talking about the, the signatures on the documents. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to uh, remind the audience uh, to keep submitting your questions. We do have around 10 minutes to try and answer as many questions or thoughts as possible. Um, and uh, I'll let, uh, let, be able to let you guys know after today's session um, how you can access the materials used. So uh, another question. Uh, for web-based medical information systems, how easy would it be to integrate digital signatures uh, for fulfillment? Also, since the response might be to open public, uh, might be open public, uh, would uh, the trusting be a problem? Okay, let me just read this question again to make sure I'm understanding the question. How would it be to integrate digital signatures for fulfillment? Um, I, I'm not 100% clear on the uh, answers. This might be one that the person asking the question has to submit. The bottom line is that uh, when, um, when you're hosting a electronic signature, including a digital signature service, for individuals outside of your organization to sign documents, one of the procedural things you need to determine up front 
is how are we verifying the identity of the signer before we allow them to sign. For digital signature deployments within an enterprise, it's very easy to identify your own employees and to trust your own employees and to give them credentials. But if it's someone out there you're not meeting face to face, they're an individual in cyberspace, what's the process we need to go through to identify these individuals? Um, today, kind of the benchmark is what are we doing in paper? So if I need some outside party today to sign a document, the typical process is send them an email with a PDF attachment um, or maybe FedEx them a bunch of paper. Regardless, the, the document ends up in paper, someone ink signs it, and FedExes it back. So the level of identity proof we went through was the ability to communicate with that individual through email or through a FedEx known address with the name on that, that FedEx or, or whatever the courier service is. So we should do at least this, if not more, in the electronic world. So I always remind our clients, uh, if we're going to allow outside parties to sign, let's do an email verification that we could communicate with them. Let's have them enter some other information about themselves to establish their uniqueness um, so that we have a, a level of confidence that this is indeed the individ individual claiming that they are, and then we can allow them to sign documents. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, another question, what is the relationship between ARX Cosign and DocuSign? Okay, uh, I, I guess this came up because of uh, uh, the press release last week, but yeah. Um, so DocuSign is the, the world's largest supplier of electronic signatures um, through a SaaS model. Um, and DocuSign is a fast growing company that, that Originally was serving the, uh, the consumer marketplace, in particular the real estate marketplace. Um, and they have a, a cloud service that you can pay a fee and have people sign documents. Um, as they are looking for new markets and growing their business, they started to expand out into um, enterprises. So there are some life science companies that, that sign contracts and agreements, particularly when there's a countersigner outside of the, your own organization that needs to sign an NDA or some other other agreement. Um, but again, they're looking to grow beyond this into uh, other markets such as the life sciences market or into the European market. And they, they made a strategic decision, and this was announced last week, that they've actually replaced their entire electronic signature uh, system technology embedded in their service with our Cosign product. So the bottom line is DocuSign now, moving forward, uh, I believe sometime towards the end of the year, we'll be offering digital signatures um, with anyone who signs their documents. So the relationship is uh, ARX is a digital signature vendor. Um, DocuSign is a business partner that has our technology embedded in their cloud service. Great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and another question. Uh, in the EU, uh, do digital certificates need to be obtained from government qualified certificate authorities? Uh, yeah, sure. So the people that aren't familiar with the European requirements may be confused by this, but uh, um, in some jurisdictions throughout Europe, um, particularly for government employees, government applications, uh, the legislation within those countries requires that, that people need to go to some government blessed certificate authority, as they're called, and obtain their digital identity for them to use. Um, countries like Spain and Italy, Germany, et cetera, I would say are the more strict in this. And, uh, and um, in general, this does not impact decisions in private industry. So, you know, although anyone digitally signing documents in the Italian government goes through this approach, private business typically does not. Um, German, very strict marketplace. In general, even government employees really aren't using digital signatures today. <clears throat> Private industry, however, there's lots of medical device companies, biopharma companies based in Germany using digital signatures, but they uh, have all assumed that this, uh, these requirements don't apply to them and don't go through the government-sponsored uh, certificate authorities. 
Perfect. Thank you. Um, this next question is uh, quite a long one, and it's got, it's got multiple questions in one. So, um, in terms of 21CFRP11, uh, is the embedded information in the signature page or tab of the document considered sufficient for an audit trial on its own, or is the uh, other external information required? And how does this information behave when the document is subjected to further processing, for example, as part of a compliance submission? Um, is the integrity broken in any way? So there are uh, multiple questions in one there. Sure. So um, the first thing I'll state is that there's no such thing as an FDA seal of Part 11 compliance that you can stick on your product. Um, there never will be. Uh, compliance with, with Part 11 is about the technology, uh, technology usage, but it's also about the policy procedure operation of, of this technology. So you wrap all those things together and you come up with a Part 11 compliant solution. The electronic and digital signature uh, components of Part 11 are just that. They, they deal with uh, Part 11's electronic signature requirements. To some degree, they also deal with electronic record requirements as well. So at the file level property where these digital signatures are embedded within the, the electronic records, there is, uh, in certain file formats, in particular PDF, the ability to have the audit trail and revision history associated with that document. An example would be uh, the PDF file format um, is set up such that every digital signature embedded inside of that file versions the document. So if I have a form that needs five signatures and perhaps the fillable form that changes between signatures, um, if I receive that, that single PDF file with all five signatures in it, I have the ability to go back and interrogate what the contents look like when any one of those signatures was applied. In fact, I can compare uh, changes in between versions. So some of that revision history, some of that audit trail is, is part of the file. But uh, you know, the full check-in, check-out, full revision history associated with documents is typically a function of the document management system or content management system, um, whether it be a commercially available platform like SharePoint, Documentum, or LiveLink, or it could be just a file share system with controls built in so that um, you can't save a file with changes on top of another file. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. So um, we've got time for just one more question. Um, how are clients reacting when the certificate is expired and appears as a not valid expression in Word documents? Okay. So uh, this sounds like a specific technology or deployment issue, which uh, if the person wants to reach out to me and talk about it, Ken. Um, the, uh, uh, the way digital signatures are verified when you open up a file is it's not, it doesn't care if the certificate embedded inside of that file has expired. The only thing it cares about is that at the time the signature was applied, that, that identity, that that digital certificate was valid. So if I was issued a certificate uh, uh, yesterday, I signed a document today, and uh, my certificate was set to expire after two days, so it's no longer valid tomorrow. Fifty years from now, someone opens up that digitally signed document. <clears throat> the document, whether it be a Word or Excel or PowerPoint or PDF, all it's going to do is look to see, hey, when this document was signed today, was that user's identity uh, valid? doesn't care what happened after the document was signed. Brilliant. Perfect. Well, yeah, um, thank you very much for that there, Rod. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. So um, I'd just like to thank Rod uh, for what was a great presentation, and thank you to ARX for sponsoring uh, today's session. A special uh, further thanks goes out to Leah Fisherman for her help today. So uh, the webinar resources will be made available at our website, which is wwwbusiness review Hyphen webinars with an s at the end dot com shortly. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at BR Webinars for daily updates, and join our LinkedIn group, Business Review Webinars, where we will uh, also share the resources um, across there.
If your questions were uh, uh, not answered in the time allocated or you would like to get into touch with Rod after today's session, then please take note of the contact details on your screen currently and uh, I'm sure Rod will be more than happy to answer any questions or thoughts that you may have. So uh, once again, I'd just like to uh, thank you, Rod, for your presentation and um, I hope you all have a lovely day.